good afternoon, and we are now looking at the Eighth Commandment on this Monday evening lecture. This is Lecture 25, Part 1, Commandment Number 8, which is found in Exodus 20, verse 15. Let's review the first two verses of Exodus chapter 20 as a reminder. It says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Then in verse 15, he says, Thou shalt not steal. Very basic command, but one that needs to be taken very seriously. Now, the seventh commandment dealt with our purity and our chastity. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The eighth commandment deals with our wealth, our material goods, and our estate. Thou shalt not steal. This commandment is considered a negative command in the aspect, aspect that it forbids something with no other explanation at all. It forbids us to rob others or ourself or God. So there's different ways that a person can actually steal and be breaking this commandment. For ourselves, we can waste what we have Wasteful spending or a wasteful use of resources is actually stealing. By not rendering to God what is rightfully His, we steal from Him, according to the book of Malachi. By withholding what we have from others, we are being stingy. We are robbing ourselves of a blessing in giving, and we're robbing them from the opportunity to be helped. By resting from others what they have, thus we are being a robber. We are stealing. So there's ways that a person can rob from others as well. Um, one place, the Bible talks about removing the ancient landmarks. When we take things from, uh, when, we, when we steal someone's borders or uh, we move a fence six inches over because the resident never comes to that part of the property and checks on anything that's been 25 years and who's going to know it or we re we move a marker that's in the ground to another location <clears throat> that's removing an ancient landmark uh, by taking from our neighbors their rights someone i know one time put up a gate for the sole intention of preventing their neighbors from utilizing a rightful access. I also know of a relative of mine who was sued by someone because they put a gate up on their own property to protect themselves from encroachment, but they wanted that access to that property so bad they were willing to sue my relative in order to get access to it. That's another form of thievery. By taking your neighbor's goods, say his house or his fields or his property forcibly or even in a clandestine manner. By overreaching in bargains, by the deal being too good to pass up or beyond expectation, if there's a sleight of hand involved in order to make someone want to buy something, that is a form of stealing as well. Even, even if you say, well, no, you know, they knew all the details. But if it was a sleight of hand on your part, years and years ago, I worked for a car dealership when I lived in Florida. I was in between churches, and I remember going to work for this car dealership and never sold cars in my life. Hope I never have to again. Very difficult business. Those that are involved in the car industry are uh, much, much better salesmen than I could ever be and uh, can handle people better than I could ever handle them. I'll tell you that. Uh, it's, it's a challenge uh, to be in that industry at any time. But I remember a car sitting on the front lot for only uh, it was a little used car. Of course, now we're talking several years ago. It was only a few thousand dollars. And a lady called and said, Hey, I'm a single mom looking for a reliable car. Saw that little car. It looked like it was in the price range, but I can't remember exactly how much it was. She said, I'd like to come down and look at it. I said, no problem, come on down. So I went to my manager and said, hey, lady's about to come in here and look at this car. And I'm going to say the car was $3,800, a little used car. 
And he said, hey, go out there, mark off the $3,800, put $4,800 on it. I'm like, why? He said, well, he said, that way you'll be able to negotiate down. You take $1,000 off that car, she's going to think you're doing her a favor. At that moment, I knew that this manager was unscrupulous and he was willing to steal from somebody. Now, one might argue. If you sold the car to her for $3,800, you sold it for exactly what you originally had it listed for. But I would be doing so by sleight of hand and deception. So I backed away from the deal and allowed another salesman to take it. And sure enough, he did exactly what the manager wanted. He got what he was asking for that car, but he did it in an underhanded way. I wanted no part of that. Working for other managers, I found them to not be unscrupulous like him. So not everyone in the car industry is a thief. But in this instance, my manager was stealing from other people. He was overreaching in bargains. Uh, by not restraining, uh, restoring what is borrowed uh, or what is found. So if I find something that belongs to someone else, I need to make sure it gets back to that individual. If I, in fact, not only uh, find something that belongs to somebody else, I need to make swift efforts to get it back to them because they have indeed lost it and would like it back. If you borrow something from someone, have full intentions of returning, returning it without any strings attached as soon as possible and return it cleaner and better than when you found it. If you borrow someone's vehicle, it's a good policy. There's, I said, there's no biblical command of this. Well, I would say charity would be the guiding force in a decision like this. Borrow someone's vehicle, return it with a full tank of gas. Well, I only got it, I only had a quarter tank of gas. And they let you borrow a multi-thousand dollar device to get you from one location to another. The least you can do is put a $40 tank of gas in it, depending on what you can find gas for. Uh, so. It's just, it's just a matter of charity in that aspect. Another form of stealing is when we don't pay our debts or when we shirk on rent or wages. Uh, I have a friend who told me that when he would pay rent, he would always pay it 10 days late. He said 15 days late meant that, there was, that you could be penalized. He said, but I use that money for the next 10 days before I pay it. But that was not the agreement he signed up on. The agreement he signed up on was to pay on the first of the month. If after the 15th day he was late, they would be charged a fee. The company, in good faith, was saying, we understand that from time to time things come up and we'll give you to the 15th. But instead of honoring what he committed to do and say it's due on this date, he wanted to always wait the last possible minute to pay, which, again, is a form of theft. And you may in, in your conscience say, no, no, no. The agreement is I'm only penalized after a certain date. But let's reverse that. Let's let you be the person that's depending on receiving rent on a piece of property or a good at the very first of the month. And every time you can just about count on this person being late by at least almost two full weeks. How would that make you feel? Do you feel like that you were being treated unfairly? Yes, I would too. Debts and wages, not paying our debts and not paying our wages. And this also includes making sure that when you commit to pay somebody to do a particular job, that you in fact pay them what you promised them when you promised them. If you promised them day wages, at the end of that day, pay them. If you promised them that you were going to uh, pay them every week, make sure that every week they get that paycheck, whatever your agreement is if you borrowed money from somebody and you took and they and you told them that you're going to pay it back on a certain date uh, that you're going to ensure that they get it at this time or that time make sure that you're faithful to do those very things if not immediately contact them explain what's going on and make another arrangement with them if they're willing to negotiate something like that but let that be rare let it be far and few between because thou shalt not steal is a plain basic command without a lot of detail. So we want to make sure that we don't try to take advantage of it just because it is a simple command. So, 
by not giving our employer a fair day's work. If you hire on with an employee, employer and you tell them, or they tell you, we need you to stand on this line for eight hours and count buttons. If the buttons come by on the conveyor belt, your job is to count them. Then what you do for eight hours is you count buttons. Now your boss may give you a 10 minute break in the morning before lunch, 30 minute lunch break, and a 10 minute lunch in the afternoon, a 10 minute break in the afternoon. Not counting normal bathroom breaks, you would be there for the duration, probably six hours and say 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something around there at a minimum laboring. More, more likely seven hours, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. But the truth is, I, I know in an eight hour shift, a lot of times you can't get in all the minutes between lunches and breaks and get a full, say, seven hours and, and 10 minutes of labor. It might be six and a half hours. But whatever the reality is, seek to labor all the hours that you've committed to for this particular employer. And uh, don't, don't try to tithe of your time like the Pharisees and Sadducees did by counting the tiny mustard seeds and things of this nature. Get in there and do the work. Get in there and try to fulfill the obligation. I worked for a company that had a, uh, a piece pr production that you had to do every day. Let's just say it was you had to get 100 pieces done in a day. Many times, the moment the employee hit the 100 mark, they would just slow down to nearly nothing. They'd get their production in for the day, and they'd be done. A lot of them had figured out how to carefully work and get 100 pieces just about quitting time, and then they would be okay. There were a couple of employees that felt like it was their mission to try to do much better. So the company came up with a policy. They would bonus people that could do more than that. Do you know who complained about that? The people that always tried to get just what their requirement was in in their shift. They complained. Well, they shouldn't be paid more for doing more. We're only told we have to get a hundred pieces done. Instead of saying, hey, here's an opportunity for me to make more money. I know how to get exactly the amount of amount done in eight hours. Hey, I can get paid more for actually working more. But laziness in man knows no obstacles. He'll find a way to do as little as possible most of the time. So give your employer a fair day's work within the most reasonable aspect of what you can do for them. As I mentioned earlier, robbing the Lord misspending that which has been dedicated to the Lord, not giving our tithes and offerings. Maybe you've committed of your salaries that you're going to give 10% because God has commanded it. But on top of that, you say, I'm also going to give 5% every month to the missions offering. And something comes up this month and you can't give that 5%. Well, let me ask you this. What about that missionary that you've committed to help support? Is that missionary now going to suffer because you haven't set aside anything in addition? I always find real encouragement in my heart when I, when I see people who are committed to pay their missionaries. I had a friend one time who uh, went through our Bible college and he pastored a church locally and he told me, he said, when I was in the military overseas, we had a missionary pastor in our church from the United States. He said, you couldn't have paid that guy enough for what he did. He said, if you'd have tripled his salary, he would have been underpaid. He was so faithful and such a help and a blessing to our family in a strange country over there. And he was a military missionary. And he said, I, I can't begin to tell you how joyful it was to sit under his ministry. So that man had committed so much a month to missions. For some reason, they left our church about six months, seven months into the commitment that he had made toward our missionary. You know what that man did? He cleared it through his pastor, but he continued to send money to our missionary for the remainder of the time that he committed to do it. I found that to be astounding. That man did not want to break the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal. Also, by misusing or appropriating public funds for a person's own private use. 
this happens many times by people reaching into the teal and doing things or finding a way that they can rake tax dollars out of everyone else's pocket to aid them in some way. It's a, it, it's a fine line of morality involved in that many times. But the truth is we ought not be appropriating public funds for private use. An example might be the government's officials who spend public money on their own agendas or uh, for their own vacations or political gain by taking money that was not allocated to them for a specific use and using it for something else. The public official who spends the public money to further his own political agenda is really a thief. Also, by robbing the employer and therefore robbing the consumer. Um, listen to these statistics from a security officer. Now, these statistics are about 15, 15 years old, maybe even 20 years old, but you're going to get the idea. The 21 year old female stole three packages of children's medicine, nine bars of soap, and a dog chain. The total value of the item was $19.03. One of the females was the daughter of the Peoria police sergeant. Um, so what happens when this money is taken from the store? How does the store recoup it? If you think about it, here's another. Juvenile male stole a bag of chocolate covered peanuts valued at $1.50. The subject was the store's paper boy. Listen to this one. 46-year-old male stole four ribeye steaks valued at $11.50. He was on probation for manslaughter at the time. He had shot his sodomite boyfriend in the head and then run him over with a car. Listen to this one. 16-year-old male stole a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey valued at $10.60. I'll tell you now, this is definitely dated, isn't it? Well, these thieves stole from a store. But in reality, they're stealing from the consumer as well. Every thief that steals from the company or from a store is stealing from the consumer because that store has to figure out what to do. Just this past month, uh, I saw a TV special about Home Depot and the incredible problem they're having with shoplifting. And they said they're probably going to have to raise their overall store pricing by 5% just to make up for it. So who gets hurt in the end? Right. It's just like a phony insurance claim. A person tries to get more on their insurance than they actually deserve. Now the rest of our rates have to go up because somebody is doing something shady. So this, these forms of stealing, while they're, they're, they're not... They are not looked at exactly in society as somebody just reaching in somebody's pocket and taking out money. That's what ends up happening. And so being honest in all of these areas is absolutely critical. This commandment is given by God to promote our good. This commandment is to guard over our hearts in order that our hands will obey God. The command instructs us to protect our neighbor's property in a positive aspect as well as our own property. The precept governs our affections, our emotions, and our lust by the setting of bounds to our desires that would cause us to seek after worldly goods to the hurt of others and ourselves. So we don't want to be involved in seeking after worldly goods just at the cost of somebody else's pocketbook. The commandment is emphasized again. Listen to Proverbs 30 and verse number 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Interesting thought. Now listen to this. Give me what's necessary, but don't give me too much, because lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. A very helpful command for us to make sure that 
we are in fact fulfilling God's law, uh, the commandment is showing us our proper duty in society. And in showing us our proper duty in society, we see five things. Preservation, protection, provision, practice, and placement. And here's what I mean. First, a proper preservation of property. To thy own property and thy own neighbors, we have the obligation to preserve that property. Doing good to our neighbor, showing charity to our neighbor. You can't say, it's my neighbor's problem. No, we need to keep an eye out for our neighbor. Secondly, a proper protection of property to secure a capability for ourselves, our families, and our neighbors to, to keep the property that we presently own. Thirdly, a proper provision in propriety. 2 Corinthians 8.21 tells us providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. We want to be use our propriety in the fact that we are in the eyes of our neighbor being faithful, that we're not stealing or doing something underhanded. And then a proper practice in dealing with others. Matthew 7.12 reminds us, therefore do all things whatsoever you do that men would do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So think about it. Whatever you're willing to do to men, you ought to be willing to let them do back to you. And whatever they do to you good, you ought to be willing to do back to them good. Somebody does something for you and then you say, oh, thank you so much, and then you make them a pie or you do something for them and say, oh, I didn't do that to get anything. I know. But I'm trying to fulfill this command that says, therefore, all things whatsoever you would, you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. If I want my neighbor to be honest with me, I need to be honest with my neighbor. If I want my neighbor to be willing to loan me things freely when I ask for them, I need to be willing to loan things freely to them. We can't just assume that everybody owes us. And then finally, on that point, a proper placement of boundaries. Now, a sacred enclosure within your property, say a fence line, for example, which nobody can lawfully enter without your consent, is absolutely reasonable, rational, and ought not to be contested. But a lot of people will contest this. You don't have a right to put a fence up on your property, they'll say. You can't keep me off your property, but it is your property. And if you're trying to protect a garden, maybe a plant, maybe children, or just your house in and of itself, there should be no law restricting our ability to enclose our property for our safety. Some cities will say, yeah, you can enclose your property, but we're going to tell you what you're allowed to enclose it with. Now, if you've moved onto that property prior to any type of announcement like that, and then they come out with a law, you have every right to go fight it. But if you've moved into a neighborhood that has restrictions already in it, and they tell you what kind of fence they can put up, what kind you can't, you moved into that property with that knowledge, you shouldn't be fighting it, because that was the agreement of the property owners before you got there. However, to enforce something against you that was never an agreement of another property, that's a problem. Now, our county has rules on sanitation. In other words, if they see that your property is getting filthy, junked up, cars piled out front, they have the ability under the statute of our county to come in and tell you you have to clean up that property. I don't think that's any problem in the world as far as sanitation and things are concerned because you know that moving into this county, what those statutes are. If you don't, well, then ignorance of the law, then it costs you. But should people be able to come on and tell you what to do on your property in the event that there are no established or standing laws like that? Of course not. Of course not. By the way, we live in a society that if you don't like the existing law and the way that it is, you've got county commissioners, you have representatives of the state, you even have a senator that represents you in Washington, D.C. You can go a long way with your um, efforts to change laws and make things more appealing for yourself. Just don't be a jerk in the process. All right, so this commandment number eight, thou shalt not steal, Exodus 2015. 
what do you think the first sin in the Bible was? Now, this is hotly contested. A lot of people will argue what the first sin was. Some would say all Ten Commandments were, 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 were broken with one fell swoop. And I understand what they mean by that. But the, the sin of theft, I'm going to argue for this particular lecture, was the first sin recorded in the, in the Bible. The first sin committed by man, then, was stealing. Now, you don't have to agree with me on that, and that's perfectly okay. I'm not making a doctrine out of it. I'm just making a point for this lecture. Genesis 2.16 And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. All right, there's the command. For the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So you've been given a command, and you're told, Don't do this. Don't eat of my fruit tree. Well, uh, we know what they did, don't they? Don't we? They took something from the tree that they weren't supposed to take. It was not theirs to take, and they took it. And as a result, sin entered in the garden. The first sin, arguably, committed against Israel after they entered the land of Canaan was indeed theft. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them, maybe that's his first sin, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So it was Achan who at the battle of Jericho decided instead of destroying everything, he was going to take something that wasn't his, and he took it. And like I said, maybe your argument is that it's actually coveting, and could be. I'm not going to argue with you on this at all, but just for the point of this lecture and understanding the, the uh, seriousness of stealing. Um, and interestingly enough, when you look at the record of the first sin of the church, so the first sin was in the garden, the first sin entering into Canaan land, and the first recorded sin of the church, what do you think it was? Yeah, stealing. Acts chapter 5, verse number 2. There was a man who sold some land, and he and his wife covenanted together that they were going to say, we sold it for this much, and therefore we're giving this much. When in fact, they sold it for this much, but they only gave a little of it. And it says, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. They stole from the church. You say, how do they steal from the church? Because when you prom promise somebody and don't deliver it, we call that defrauding. And fraud is theft. And so they stole. So I find it interesting. In the garden, they took fruit that was not theirs to take. Entering into Canaan land, he took possessions that he was commanded not to take. And finally, the church is inaugurated with someone saying, oh, I'm going to give this much of my income, and they don't. So we have these sins. It's usually one of the first sins committed by children. And, and I say this in a very broad range as well. Uh, stealing may be maintained in the things we have not done as well as the things that we have done. Okay, keep that in mind. That's a little bit of a tricky thought in your mind. Stealing may be manifested in things that we have not done as well as the things we have done. Uh, somebody might say this. I never cut my neighbor's throat, my neighbor's purse. I never stole. I never spoiled his house or land. But God have mercy on my soul. For I am haunted day and night by all the deeds I have not done. O oh, unattempted loveliness, O oh, costly valor, never won. There's a lot of times that we owe a debt of service to our neighbor that we don't fulfill. Owe oh, a debt of thankfulness to someone that we do not pay. Owe oh, a debt of gratitude to our parents that we fail to do by not honoring them appropriately. In effect, we are stealing from them. We owe something to the community in which we live also. 
um, the employer who has employed us, the society that is around us, the church that we're part of, and the world that is in need of Christ. When we do not do what we should do, we become thieves. Paul said in Romans 1.14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. See you tomorrow night for part two of Lecture 25.